Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The course taken by Puritans in New England was shaken during the mid-17th century when English monarch Charles I sparked a crisis with the British Parliament that led to a bloody civil war that had direct repercussions on North America and the colonization of the Atlantic coast. Puritan Oliver Cromwell was an English statesman, politician, skilled soldier, and a leading advocate of the execution of King Charles I in 1649, which led to the establishment of the Commonwealth of England that he ruled as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. Let's learn more from these podcasts, Five Minutes in Church History and Five Minute Biographies. The July of 1649. In that year, there was a book published and there was an act of parliament. Let's first talk about the book's author. The book's author was Edward Winslow. He was born in 1595 in Old England. He immigrated to New England and then later in life, he'd go back to Old England. And he died there in 1655. Now, he was not just any old immigrant. He was one of the signers of the Mayflower Compact. That's right, one of the original members of the Plymouth Colony. And he was also an historian alongside William Bradford. He too chronicled the Pilgrims in his 1624 book titled Good News from New England, or as the longer title has it, A True Relation of Things Very Remarkable at the Plantation of Plymouth in New England, showing the wondrous providence and goodness of God in their preservation and continuance, being delivered from many apparent deaths and dangers. Well, in addition to being an historian, he was also an active explorer. He established posts throughout Maine and up and down the Connecticut River. He served as a default minister, and he served three one-year terms as the colony's governor. In 1649, he published one of his other books. It was titled, The Glorious Progress of the Gospel Among the Indians in New England. And that summer, in July of 1649, that book led to the founding of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England. There was also an act passed in Parliament under Oliver Cromwell's Parliament on July 27, 1649, that allowed for money to be raised in England for the work of evangelization in New England among the Native Americans. The society operated mostly in New England and also a bit in Virginia and New Hampshire. After the Revolutionary War and America's independence, the society shifted its focus to Canada, primarily in New Brunswick, and on to the other territories in the British Empire. The society opened schools and planted churches and in one case sponsored a Bible translation, and that is John Eliot's Bible. This Bible was published in 1663, and this leaf is Hosea chapter 4 and chapter 5. Eliot's Bible was published in the Algonquin language, and it was part of those efforts to spread the gospel among the Native Americans. The society was actually founded for the purpose of, quote, the dissemination of Christian knowledge and the means of religious instruction among all those in their country who were destitute of this. The early missionaries include John Eliot, Eliezer Wheelock, John Sargent, Gideon Hawley, John Cotton. Even Jonathan Edwards was one of the missionaries for the society when he went out to Stockbridge and did the work there among the Mohicans and the Mohawk and the Stockbridge Native Americans. And Edwards' son, Jonathan Edwards Jr., was also one of the society's missionaries. In fact, when he was just a young teenager and living there at Stockbridge, he went with John Brainerd deep into the mountains of New York to take the gospel to Native Americans. Of course, John Brainerd was the brother of David Brainerd, and he was a missionary for 30 years with the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Many of these missionaries lived among these Native American nations or tribes. They would learn the language. They formed alphabets and wrote grammar books and preached in the language of the Native Americans. In fact, Jonathan Edwards Jr. wrote a grammar of the Mohican language. Circling back to Edward Winslow and his book that started it all. In Plymouth, by 1670, that's 21 years after he published the book and after the founding of the society, there were 24 churches for the Native Americans in Plymouth 
Colony. Well, that's a book and an act of Parliament from 1649. In the heart of the 17th century, England was a nation at war with itself, a stage ripe for the rise of a man like Oliver Cromwell. This era was characterised by a whirlwind of religious and political turmoil. The Church of England was grappling with dissension within its ranks, while the monarchy was struggling to hold on to power amid increasing discontent. Simultaneously, the country was divided by class and religious affiliations, leading to heightened social tensions. The English Civil War, a devastating and divisive conflict, was a reflection of these turbulent times. Royalists and parliamentarians clashed violently, each side fighting for their vision of England's future. This unrest provided the perfect backdrop for a man like Cromwell to rise from obscurity. With the nation in crisis, there was a desperate need for strong leadership, for someone who could navigate the treacherous waters of this troubled period. Thus, in these tumultuous times, a man named Oliver Cromwell began to make his mark on history. Born into the middle gentry on the 25th of April, 1599, Oliver Cromwell was not destined for great power, yet great power he achieved. His early life was rather unremarkable, marked by a modest upbringing and a stint in Parliament, but the tide of his fate shifted with the onset of the English Civil War. Cromwell, a man of deep religious conviction, found himself at the heart of the conflict, siding with the parliamentarians against King Charles I. His leadership skills and strategic acumen were soon recognised and he rapidly climbed the ranks, eventually leading the new model army. His victories at Marston Moor and Naseby not only cemented his reputation as a formidable military leader, but also turned the tide in favour of the parliamentarians. But Cromwell's rise didn't stop there. Amid the tumult of war and political strife, he emerged as a key player in the trial and execution of Charles I. This was a pivotal moment in English history, marking the end of an era of divine right monarchy. It was an audacious act, one that would have been unthinkable just a few years prior. Yet Cromwell, driven by his belief in the sovereignty of Parliament, played an instrumental role in bringing the King to justice. With the execution of Charles I, Cromwell had irrevocably changed the face of English governance. In the power vacuum left by the monarchy, Cromwell found himself at the helm of a new political entity, the Commonwealth of England. Suddenly, the humble farmer from Huntingdon was not just a military leader, but a political one too. As Lord Protector, Cromwell sought to bring about a godly republic, implementing policies that would steer England towards this vision. Despite the turmoil, Cromwell attempted to instill a sense of religious tolerance, a move that was both revolutionary and controversial for the time. However, his rule was far from peaceful. Military campaigns in Ireland and Scotland painted a stark contrast to his domestic policies, with the violent suppression of royalist uprisings leaving a blemish on his rule. Yet, regardless of the contradictions, there was no denying the impact of his leadership. His reign saw the first and only time in history that England was declared a republic. Cromwell's rule, though brief, was marked by significant changes in England's religious and political landscape. He died on the 3rd of September, 1658, at the Palace of Whitehall in London. Oliver Cromwell, a man of contradictions, left behind a legacy that continues to be debated to this day. His influence is a complex tapestry of diverse perspectives, each reflecting a different facet of his character and actions. Some view him as a champion of liberty. They applaud his role in the fight against the monarchy, seeing him as a driving force behind the establishment of a republic in England. This perspective appreciates Cromwell as a defender of the rights of everyone, a revolutionary who challenged the status quo. Yet, there is another side to Cromwell's legacy, one that paints him in a darker light. To these critics, Cromwell is a despot who imposed his will without regard for the rule of law. 
his brutal military campaigns in Ireland and his suppression of political opposition at home are often cited as evidence of this. Today, Cromwell's legacy remains a subject of intense debate. His posthumous execution, a symbolic act of retribution by the restored monarchy, is a testament to the deep divisions he left behind. Yet in a BBC poll of the 100 greatest Britons, he ranked among the top 10, indicating a continued respect for his contribution to English history. Whether viewed as a hero or a villain, Oliver Cromwell's impact on English history is undeniable, and his story continues to captivate us centuries later. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>